New York's classic rock, Q1043. I welcome a friend of Q104.3 and a very good friend of Sunstein Sunday, Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum. She has devoted 20 years in defense of women's hearts. She's a spokesperson for Go Red for Women, part of the American Heart Association. But she's here this morning because there is a new initiative that you have launched. Tell us about it. I have been on this path for 20 years, really. I feel like fighting the good fight for women's hearts. And we know that heart disease is the number one killer of all women, more than all cancers combined. And I will tell you that for the past 20 years, my mission has been trying to figure out how to prevent this disease from really striking. And after all these years, I have put together a real personalized preventive strategy unique to women, it's called Cadence. It looks at anatomy, physiology, functional data, uh, metabolism, genetics, and inflammatory markers, and really can tailor our preventive strategies to each woman individually. And it also is able to pick up disease really, really early on before it strikes. And that is also so critical to this mission. And where is it offered? Well, right now I'm here in New York City. Um, I'm on 61st and 5th and I'm seeing patients here, but we will be expanding across the country and hopefully everyone will have access to the program sooner than later. So how is this different from other ways of preventing heart disease in women? When we really look at the preventive strategies, we go through the risk factors. And these risk factors have been around forever. The Framingham risk analysis uh, was developed in the 50s. And in looking at these risk factors, we look at blood pressure and cholesterol and sugars. But what we know is that for women, this risk score is not very sensitive. It's not really specific for women. And so a lot of women have been missed in the preventive strategies. This is so different because it actually looks at women and how each woman functions, her physiologic data, her functional data. This isn't just risk factors. This is figuring out how her heart works, how her arteries work, and how using metabolic data and genetic data, we can create almost a puzzle piece, putting together a puzzle of who she is. And so it's looking at prevention from a completely different lens. You know, it's really interesting when you talk about how these things can be different for women, because I remember just so vividly, it's not just heart health. Um, Right after I think my daughter-in-law got the COVID vaccine, she immediately got her period. And she went on Twitter and it was like a pattern with a lot of women. And none of us were warned before that. I mean, it's one thing if you know, but in all the, you know, and I've really followed COVID, you know, on a daily basis because obviously it's one of the biggest stories of our time, but nobody ever mentioned that. And women were freaking and yeah. it's it's just this constant women's health is not the same as men's health. And yet we're held to that standard until these surprises come up. And then it's like, oh, yeah, you're different. Oh, yeah, you. You know, I'd like to address that in two different ways, because I think you bring up one of the most frustrating points. More women started dying of heart disease than men in 1985. And the reason for that was there was literally no research done on women for the 20 years prior. Wow. The fact that there was no research, you know, it caught up to us. But okay, so you think, oh, clearly things have changed. Let me tell you, no. There is like in all of these cardiology studies, women are included. The the number of participants are only 25 to 30% in these big research trials. That's not true for things like that come from the NIH that are governmentally subsidized trials because those now require that 50% be women. But I will tell you in these major medical trials, device trials, none of it looks at women the same amount as men. So to your point, yeah, we are different and yeah, A lot is not known about us. 
But I really want to talk a little bit about COVID too, because one of the things that I look at is the health of the lining of the artery. It's not very sexy, but it's called the endothelium. And the lining of the artery is really what keeps us healthy. When COVID started, we thought this was a disease of the lungs and pneumonia. People were getting ventilated, that this was what we call an acute respiratory distress syndrome that was happening. Well, the reality is, as time went on, do you remember we started hearing about strokes and heart attacks right. and clotting? Well, this is actually a disease of the lining of the artery. That clotting happens when the endothelium is sort of sick. And so we started seeing things like statins that lower cholesterol are actually beneficial for people who get COVID. We started seeing that blood thinners were an important part of preventing clotting. And what I've realized and what I've seen and the research has shown is that if we treat endothelial disease, if we prevent the endothelium from getting sick, we actually will do better if we get COVID. So this work that I'm doing to prevent heart disease in women is the same work that all of us should be doing to prevent us from getting sick if we get COVID. And I gotta tell you, I don't think this is going away so soon. So it's really worth us thinking about this in a really proactive way. You mentioned a disease I have never heard of. Endothelial disease? Yes. Well, I'm glad because this is important. And we think of it in women, we call it microvascular disease and microvascular disease is probably the most common form of heart disease that women get. It's in the smaller arteries. It starts with this stiffness of the arteries. Men get these real typical big heart attacks. And a lot of times women get these more subtle ones that happen in the microvasculature. And it begins with this endothelial dysfunction or stiffness of the arteries. So how is that detected? Well, that's the problem. And that's been the huge issue. One of the problems with women and heart disease is it's really been harder to diagnose. And we can't always use the same traditional studies that we've used on men to diagnose it in women. And so what I've tried to do is find, again, all of these pieces that we could put together to say, are these arteries not healthy? Is there diffuse disease throughout the arteries that is causing stiffness and microvascular disease? And I, we can do that. It's just not through the standard mechanisms that we know. There are screening tests out there. There are other diagnostic tests that are very expensive, cardiac MRI with what we call perfusion. Does, does the blood flow in those arteries well? But what I've really tried to do is create a kind of cheap in-office way of screening for this microvascular disease and endothelial disease. And we do have the means, we do have the ability to do so. The last piece of that story is it takes about 20 years for research to hit clinical practice. Wow. And what we learned during COVID, we don't have that kind of time. And the guidelines, it takes thousands and thousands and thousands of patients and decades and decades to really get it all solidified. But the data and the research is out there. We just haven't quite implemented it yet into clinical practice. And I'm doing it based on the data that exists and the research that's showing us that we can use functional physiologic data, stress testing in a different way to really reach uh, diagnosis and prevention. I'm speaking with Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum. She has been working for 20 years in defense of women's heart health. And uh, she is a spokesperson for Go Red for Women with the American Heart Association and has just launched a new program called Cadence. And it is specifically targeted to women's heart health. Is there anything women need to do for heart health that's different from men? I think women need to pay attention and to actually know what their risk factors are and understand that all of us think if we look great on the outside, we're good on the inside. And that's not always the case. I think that women really need to start becoming more proactive, advocate for themselves, get answers, get information, 
What women need to do differently is understand that they can't hold up the entire universe on their shoulders and not have it affect them. That stress is pervasive, that putting themselves last, which happens really often, um, blowing things off, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'll feel better tomorrow. You know, all of those things that all of us do is not good for us. And actually being proactive about our health and pay attention, paying attention to our health is one of the first and foremost things that we need to do. Let's talk a little bit about, let's say, exercise. The rules always change. How much are we supposed to get and at what moderation? Because this is really difficult for people to fit into their lives. At the same time, we're coming off COVID and pandemic shutdown and people gaining a tremendous amount of weight on average, which is very difficult to lose. I think exercise is one of the most interesting things and partially challenging for people because it's not intuitive. When you tell someone go exercise, they're like, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, where do I start? And so the American Heart Association really talks about 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. Well, what does that mean? And for each one of us, it's a little bit different. And I actually create exercise prescriptions for people based on the results of their cardiopulmonary exercise test that I do in my office. This is unique to the individual woman or man, and it's based on that endothelial artery issue. But basically what I can tell you is the concept of going out there and getting super sweaty, super exhausted is not what we need. What we need is to just get moving and get our heart rates up to a level that is in this moderate range that we feel like we can breathe and talk, but it might be just a little bit harder. We don't have to be panting and sweating and all of that stuff. We just need to be getting our heart rates up to a moderate level that we actually feel like it's just a little harder to talk. So there's this interesting thing that's going on right now that I've noticed with society in general. On the one hand, we are encouraged to be of a certain weight because we're told that that is healthy. At the same time, our society is embracing people of all sizes. Gap really stands out. They're running these full page ads. They no longer have a plus section. They have one section for women so that if you are a larger size woman, you don't feel inferior, you don't feel different. So it's, we're sort of getting two different messages. How do you deal with that? It's interesting. I think about this a lot. I mean, there's been so much body shaming and we certainly saw the decades of anorexia being in. And that is that was the most unhealthy and detrimental, certainly to young girls and all women, comparing themselves to people who really, really were emaciated. The pendulum often swings in this country. I compare it to saying when everyone was on a certain diets in the 80s, it was a full carb diet, then everyone got really fat, and then it became a full fat diet. You know, there's no middle ground here. But what I would like to say about this whole issue is two things. We know that obesity and being overweight can increase your blood pressure, increase your cholesterol and increase your sugars and cause diabetes. We know these are risk factors for heart disease and we cannot get around that. For people who are overweight or obese, it is incredibly important to understand that if it is unhealthy for you, it's simply unhealthy. We don't need to talk about being emaciated, super skinny. We need to talk about health. The other piece, and one of the trials that I thought was fascinating, is it compared fatness and fitness. And it turns out if you're a little chunky, but in great shape, it's fine. So I'm gonna tell you, if you're overweight and you're exercising and you're healthy, don't worry about it. But all of this does matter in the big picture. And how would people get in touch with you if they have questions or they want more information? You can go to my website, drsuzannesteinbaum.com. You can reach me through there. You can reach my office through there. And, um, you know, I think every month should be Heart Month for Women. 
I think every day we need to pay attention to our hearts and how we feel. It's a precarious time and our health is the most important thing. Thank you so much, Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum. And coming up next, my boss, Bernie Weiss. He's the president of iHeartMedia New York, and he has just written a book called Ace It, and it's really a how-to manual if you want to go into sales. I mean a real how-to manual. And he's coming up next, Q104.3. New York's classic rock, Q104.3.